Um, let me welcome you here this evening to a, to a great event. This is the finalists of the ANU Grand Challenges Scheme. My name is Margaret Harding. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at ANU, and I will be your MC here this evening. Uh, before we begin, let me first acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Um, as I said, a really warm welcome to the ANU research community who are here this evening, but also to our external guests and members of the Canberra community who have come along this evening. I hope to be entertained, inspired, enthused by some of the great research that is going on at the ANU. Um, this scheme is a $50 million initiative which was part of the new strategic plan launched by the ANU Vice-Chancellor early last year. Within that, let me read through to you one of the uh, premises or the strategies outlined in that was that we will invest over the course of the plan in five globally significant research challenges that deliver solutions to national priorities and ensure core disciplines and research strengths are ranked alongside the best in the world. It's a program and uh, um, a scheme that has been run and coordinated in a manner different to the way we have funded previous projects in the university. In particular, the Vice-Chancellor is committed to ensure that as the National University, we use our resources and invest in long-term strategic programs, high-risk, high-reward uh, programs of research that are difficult to be funded externally, but also ones that will really advance knowledge, will draw on our strengths, will create and combine disciplines to come up with solutions to really grand problems or wicked problems in a manner that really draws on our strengths and delivers great benefits for the nation, for the Asia Pacific region, and puts ANU rightfully in its place alongside the best universities in the world. We have been really delighted with the response across the university. Many researchers participated in an initial video pitch. Um, I've got my numbers down here somewhere. We had about um, 37 initial videos of teams were presented, another 30 teams then submitted at the next stage of the proposals, and then finally um, eight presented to a panel, and this evening you're going to see the three finalists present as part of the judging for selection of the first ANU Grand Challenge to be announced by the Vice-Chancellor later this week. Let me warmly acknowledge and thank our selection panel members who are on the first and the second row here this evening. Again, the process here was to deliberately involve uh, external uh, input into the selection of these grand challenges. So I'm pleased to acknowledge and thank very warmly my Deputy Chair Mick Kaju Hall, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Innovation, Graham Farquhar and Joan Beaumont, distinguished emeritus professors at this university who brought great research expertise into the panel. Um, Amy King, Westpac Fellow in the College of uh, Asia and Pacific. Francesca McLean, a current PhD student, one of the um, uh, superstars of uh, STEM, and who has, um, delivers, I guess, on our commitment to very active involvement of our students in partnership in many of the key decisions uh, across the university. Michelle Burke, who is a member of the Vice-Chancellor's External Industry Advisory Board. Arun Abe, a very um, passionate advocate and supporter of the university via the College of Business and Economics Industry Advisory Board. And Alan Gingell, who is an alumnus of the university, has a distinguished track record and, uh, of in public policy and in government. So I'd like to warmly acknowledge and thank particularly our external members for their time contributing to this important process. This afternoon, to give you an idea of this, the, the panel met with the three teams. They, uh, they gave us a brief overview of their projects and we had a Q&A with the panel. This evening we will give the final pictures and then tomorrow morning the panel will reconvene in terms of making final recommendations to the Vice-Chancellor. Um, in terms of the session this evening, could I uh, just advise you, the session is being recorded. 
Uh, so if you are not comfortable with that, or please be aware of that for the Q&A session later this afternoon. So each of the teams have been invited to present a 20-minute pitch. This is to really give you an overview of what their grand challenge is, why they think it's really important the university should invest in their grand challenge, and then we'll open the floor for 10 minutes Q&A from the floor, and we'll have roving mics to actually uh, assist you come up with questions. Please come up and interrogate the teams, ask them what you think, challenge them, so to speak, in terms of you know, what their research is about or things that you would like to know more about, is that it's an important part of the process this evening. So without further ado, uh, let me invite the first team to the stage. The first grand challenge is zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. And the uh, leadership team who are also presenting this evening uh, include Ken Baldwin from the Energy Change Institute, Kylie Catchpole from the Research School of Engineering, Alex Stewart, the Managing Director of CWP Renewables, Llewellyn Hughes from the Crawford School of Public Policy, and Yun Liu from the Research School of Chemistry. Energy Change Institute's Grand Challenge, Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific. I'm Ken Baldwin, I'm the Director of the Energy Change Institute and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our Grand Challenge. The research that will underpin our Grand Challenge theme aims to change the way that Australia does business with the world. In the coming decades, Australia will need to transition from a largely carbon-based resource and product exporting nation to a nation that utilises its abundant renewable energy sources to create new energy exports and new energy export products. In this uh, uh, goal, uh, we will uh, have uh, a focus on the Asia-Pacific region, region uh, for reasons uh, that will be explained to you uh, subsequently. Uh, and uh, in this process, we will also benefit the nation uh, through changes to our economy, uh, through new research insights, and we will transfer this to our neighbours in the Asia-Pacific region. Let me first uh, start by introducing uh, my team. Uh, we have uh, Professor Kylie Cashpole from the uh, Research School of Engineering in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Alex Hewitt, Director of the uh, Green Energy Company, CWP Renewables. Llewellyn Hughes from the Crawford School in the College of the Asian and Pacific, and Professor Yun Liu from the Research School of Chemistry in the College of Science. Now let me hand over to Llewellyn Hughes to tell you about the motivation behind our Grand Challenge theme. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so, as Ken said, my name is Llewellyn Hughes. Uh, I'm a Associate Professor at uh, Crawford School uh, Public Policy um, here at the, uh, at the ANU. Uh, I actually returned uh, to Australia three years ago uh, from the US, and one of the big reasons uh, that I uh, decided to do that was because, for me, uh, solving this problem, that is solving the problem of meeting uh, energy demand from the Asia Pacific in the coming decades, uh, really holds the key to uh, shifting the world uh, to a, a low carbon uh, trajectory uh, into the future. You can see here that in the coming couple of decades, the Asia-Pacific region is going to make up fully two-thirds of the expected growth in energy demand globally. And that means that by 2035, that the Asia-Pacific, China, of course, India, but also the ASEAN countries as well, are really going to come to dominate the global energy picture. Now, our view and the view of our Grand Challenge project is that this represents a tremendous opportunity for Australia. Many of you uh, know that Australia is already an energy superpower. We export enormous amounts of coal and uh, natural gas uh, to the Asia Pacific uh, region. But our project is based on the idea that we have a different opportunity. And that is our opportunity is to become a zero uh, carbon energy superpower by exporting low emissions electricity and uh, low emissions based products to the uh, Asia Pacific region.
Now, um, many of you read the newspapers, I guess we see it on the internet these days, um, but you know, front page of the newspapers every second day, discussions about Australia's electricity market, uh, the ins and outs of the whole group associated uh, with managing uh, the, the, those kind of debates. Uh, to my mind, it's really easy uh, when you follow those kinds of debates to forget just how urgent it is to meet uh, the challenge that we're describing uh, to you today. What you can see, three, see here are uh, a few different uh, emissions pathways for the future and what the uh, implications of those are for expected mean global temperature increases. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, associated with mapping out what the future uh, might look like in terms of temperature increases because of carbon emissions, but in general terms, I think you can take these as pretty indicative <coughs> of the different futures that we might face. And there are a few different things that you can take away from a picture like this. The first is, if you look at the orange line, that if we keep doing what we're doing today, that we're really going to enter into a world in which it will be extraordinarily difficult for both human and natural systems to adapt to the kind of temperature increases that, that, that implies. But it's also important to note the blue line here. Okay? This shows you that even if governments uh, meet the commitments that they uh, made during the multilateral uh, agreement that was recently reached in Paris, that we're nevertheless going to enter into a really challenging physical environment in terms of the implied uh, increases in global uh, temperatures. Uh, that includes obviously uh, Australia and, uh, and, the, uh, and the Asia, the Asia Pacific region. So you can see a couple of other pathways there. And those pathways suggest that it's still possible uh, for us to make the kinds of technical, economic, policy, and social changes that are going to be required to shift us to uh, a pathway, an emissions pathway, that give us a fighting chance to keep in global temperatures down uh, in the region of a mean increase of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. But in order to do that, the time to act is now. Because the other thing that you can see from this data is that the longer we wait, the harder it gets to do that. Now, uh, the last point I'll make before passing uh, things are, are onto, uh, onto Alex is what it requires to do that. So the first thing uh, that's required is expertise. Okay, we're going to need expertise in the physical sciences. We're going to need expertise uh, in engineering. We're going to need expertise in policy sciences and social sciences more broadly, economics, uh, managing issues like the social license to operate, and a whole host of different issues will be associated uh, with, with making that change. The great thing is here at the ANU, and that's something I've certainly realized is coming back, uh, back, uh, back here, is that those are all resources that we have in abundance here. Right? That expertise, as well as tremendous expertise in the Asia Pacific, in Indonesia, China, and you know, all the countries that will be recipients of these uh, exports that we're talking about now. So with that, what I'd like to do is pass the floor to Alex, who's going to tell you a little bit uh, with, with more detail about how we're going to go about uh, helping Asia Pacific meet uh, its energy needs while ensuring uh, a, 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 a low emissions future for Australian exports. Thank you. Thank you, Lou Allen. We'll click on to the next slide. CWP is a developer of large-scale wind and solar projects. We've developed and delivered about $3 billion worth of projects over the last 10 years. Um, Australia is the cheapest renewable energy generation in the Asia Pacific region. In this area in uh, north of the Pilbara in Western Australia is the best renewable energy resource in Australia. Outstanding solar, but also outstanding wind in terms of the way it blows the time of day, a complement of solar. Our neighbours to the north do not have this abundance of renewable energy. So in order, in order to help them with their energy needs, in particular clean energy needs, we need to export our cheap renewable energy. And there's two ways of doing this. The first is through an undersea cable, an HVDC, high voltage DC cable. And the second is to use our abundant renewable energy to extract hydrogen and to transport it in a similar way to LNG to be used as fuel. And in order to do this, we will look to draw on the expertise and the resources of the ECI, the Energy Change Institute, and this university. 
Uh, and I should say, there's a good three years of, of work, of development, of research, and feasibility studying, and, the, and, and various, various tranches of research in order to deliver these mega projects. The, the, uh, and, and they need scale. They need immense scale in order to work. So if we just have a quick look at, the, uh, at this slide here. Uh, many of you may have seen something similar. Australia's, Australia's energy resources are uh, abundant in coal and gas. We've been exporting that for many years. Uranium. Of course, we do have abundant renewable energy resources. More than we need. This is something that was prepared by the, by the ECI. Uh, this is just looking at solar radiation. It's a nice, simple uh, illustration. It's interesting, the area of dark green at the bottom of Tasmania, that's typical of the uh, resource level over in, uh, in uh, Northern Asia and North America, Europe. The area up there in Western Australia is over, over twice that. And if we look at that blue dot, a solar farm about that size would be enough to supply Australia's energy needs. About 50 gigawatts of solar. The green one is the area of a solar farm that could supply the world. So about two years ago, we commenced looking at this project called the, uh, an energy hub, a, re a renewable energy hub to export clean energy from Australia up to Indonesia and beyond, up to Singapore, potentially beyond that. Uh, there's an area of land there which uh, has been identified and secured at 14,000 square kilometres. It's 14 million hectares. It can accommodate stage one and stage two. Stage one of, of the project we envisage and we've scoped up at six gigawatts of electricity, which is four generated by wind and two from solar. The reason why the two work together so well is there's a wonderful wind there that blows regularly and it dips down in the middle of the day when the solar resource picks up. Um, four gigawatts would be 1,200 turbines. Two gigawatts of solar would be uh, 50 square kilometres of solar panels. And the two together would be transported in, a, uh, in an undersea cable, 3,300 kilometres up to Java and on to Singapore. Um, there's been great advancement in HVDC technology. So the, the losses in that cable, all that way from, from Australia up to Indonesia, is only 7%. And it's a very exciting project, but there's a lot of work to be done. It's quite a lot of research, not only on the technical side, but on the, the socio-economic and the political side. This is the first, this will be the first, intercontinental, intercontinental transfer of clean energy. The, uh, the benefits, obviously, to our northern neighbours, will be to help them with their electricity needs, and their rapidly expanding economies and, and also in particular clean energy needs. Indonesia alone has a 22% has a target for 2025, it's currently at 7%. I don't think it, it, it has a lot of hope by, by reaching these, these targets set in Paris through their indigenous resources. And from Australia's <coughs> perspective, the export value alone will be around $90 billion over the course of the project, it's about $1.5 billion brown. Um, so, some great challenges, great project, very significant outcomes. It will be historic. And I will hand now over to Kylie. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. So, in order to pursue this grand challenge, we will take a 4A approach. ANU, ACT, Australia and the Asia Pacific. So with, within ANU, we will develop the research underpinning an ANU microgrid that will help reduce the emissions from the ANU campus as well as
managing the electricity demand for the ACT. We'll then transfer that expertise to our partners in Indonesia through the Australia Indonesia Centre. We'll also develop research that will uh, underpin new export opportunities for Australia and help meet the growing energy demand of the Asia Pacific. So our research is divided into two main themes, as Alex mentioned. The first is the Asian supergrid. The Asian supergrid is the largest and most advanced renewable project of its kind in the world, connecting northern Australia with wind and solar projects up through Indonesia and Singapore. It will require world-leading innovation in the generation and storage of electricity and in also managing the demand through pumped hydro systems which could be located in northern Australia or in Indonesia. But not only on the technical side, we will also need to consider the politics and energy security of such a system. It will create new multilateral links between these countries and we will need to consider the implications of that. It will also need research on the social licence to operate and indigenous acceptance in Australia as well as uh, acceptance in Indonesia. ANU is extremely well placed to contribute to this project through our expertise in renewable energy, through our expertise in grid analysis and control, and because of our deep expertise and involvement with the economics, policy, security and governance of the Asian Pacific. Our second major theme is renewable fuels and products and this means uh, creating hydrogen for example from renewable energy which can then be used uh, as a storage mechanism and then can be exported and there are a number of different ways that you could do that either directly exporting hydrogen or by processing it, processing it into other alternative fuels first. Key issue here is that renewable fuels are currently too expensive and solving this challenge is going to take both technical and economic innovation. On the technical side we need to create new processes that can be much more efficient and much, more, much cheaper in order to reduce the cost of renewable energy, renewable energy fuels. And one way to do this would be to connect our world record efficiency solar cells in an integrated system that could produce hydrogen that could be then used to create other synthetic fuels. On the economic side, we need to create new pathways so that the cost of renewable fuels can be reduced through economies of scale. And this approach has been extremely successful in solar energy where the creation of pathways has led to a reduction in the cost of solar electricity by a factor of 10 in the last decade. If we can do this, uh, we have an enormous opportunity because we can make renewable fuels commercially viable and that will open up massive export opportunities for Australia uh, in order to help meet that growing energy demand of the Asia Pacific and replace our current fossil fuel exports. And now I'll pass over to Yun to talk about our team. Okay. Uh, this grand challenging team uh, is built based on the ANU Energy Change Institute. So as you can see, they including all seven ANU college, colleges and the ANU facility and the service. And so this team involves the, the not only expertise from uh, science and technology, but also the social uh, expertise from such as uh, quality of the Asian Pacific, quality of the laws uh, that to reflect the multidisciplinary nature of our grand chain. So the expertise in economics, uh, Indonesia, China, Japan, uh, India, um, in the indigenous studies, uh, sociological and le uh, legal uh, governance uh, policy, and uh, the security to complement the science, technology, and the energy expertise, make our teams be ready for this challenge. So this is, uh, this teams also um, closely engage with the ACT government and the, the uh, industry, 
And we also collaborate with international company in the industry and the government as well and to realize our goals in the ACT, uh, Australia, and the Asia Pacific. Our team, including uh, 72 members from uh, 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 Energy Change Institute, 25% uh, of, the, of them are female, and this reflects uh, more or less the current university gender balance. We value the uh, gender diversity in this team because women represent the half resources and half potential in any society. So with the support of this uh, grand challenge program, uh, we will make gender equality a priority in appointment. We will try to do many, many things to improve the gender balance. For example, we, are, we will have a 50% of the female representation on the leading teams and selection, uh, selection committees to drive 50% female uh, participant uh, appointment. We will also try to make the policies uh, offer uh, the career flexible employment uh, to the women to help them overcome the early career, middle career barriers. Okay. We will do similar things for early career and middle career researches as well. And we have, so far we have done very well, and we already attract the 50% of the early career, middle career research in this exciting area, because this is a very great opportunity for them as well. So we will try to do similar things to be sure that uh, their voice will, can be heard, and also we can have a team to provide the proper mentoring on their career development, because uh, their contribution is critical to this uh, grand challenge, also critical to the future of the Australia. I will pass on. Okay. Thank you, Yun. So just to summarize then, uh, our grand challenge will deliver a transformation of the way that Australia <coughs> deals with the uh, trading uh, in the rest of the world and in the Asia Pacific. And over the next five or so years, our aim is to deliver the following from our research programs. Firstly, a blueprint for an Asian supergrid powered by Australian renewables. Secondly, the creation of an ANU microgrid uh, the knowledge and the expertise from which we will then transfer and uh, adapt to the uh, areas in the Asia Pacific where that is most appropriate. Thirdly, we will uh, develop the uh, technologies and the processes needed to create new embedded energy, low carbon export products and fuels. And fourthly, we will undertake a program of development for economic frameworks that enable these technologies to then transfer this zero carbon embedded energy into export products. And overarching this entire process will be the development of policies that will enable zero carbon energy to decarbonize the economies of Australia, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, China and India, where we have particular expertise, but also other countries in the Asia Pacific region. So, the end result of this will be a series of high-risk, high-reward outcomes, but on the way we will also achieve many targets and goals that will allow us to utilise the knowledge on the route to these uh, very lofty uh, outcomes. And uh, in that regard, we uh, would uh, like to invite you to join with us and to uh, be a part of our grand challenge zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's a great um, first presentation, I think, which sets the scene for the rest of the evening. Could I please invite the team to stand at the, the front of the auditorium? And what we will have about 10 minutes now would really welcome Open questions from the audience. If you'd like to um, ask a question, could you please raise your hand? And there are some roving mics, and uh, we'll bring them to you. If you could just identify your, your name and where you're from, please. And um, the question there's one here, and there's one at the back there. Jane. Jane. <coughs> um, 
Hello. Um, I'm Sadis Anil. I'm a former uh, employee of this university. I was advised to do the interior and as well as chancellor. Uh, so anyway, my question is, uh, it sounds very exciting, everything about it, and the extraordinary economy of what we can provide to Asia. But how do you handle the existing massive infrastructure in the current fuel system, energy system of Asia Pacific? And have you thought about the financial challenges of how you can deliver this low-cost, uh, zero-carbon strategy to Asia Pacific? Yes, well, I think uh, this embraces uh, a whole range of questions that we'll aim to, uh, to focus on. And remembering that uh, the, uh, the ultimate goal is to deliver a, blu a blueprint that will enable this to happen. Uh, so uh, there are, as you say, enormous uh, geopolitical issues to uh, engage with. And this is an area in which the ANU has enormous expertise. Uh, in the College of the Asia Pacific, uh, in uh, Crawford in particular, uh, in areas that relate to uh, national security and, and, and uh, similar areas. Uh, likewise, on the economic side of things, we have enormous expertise in understanding what the pathways might be to develop uh, these, uh, these export uh, industries. Uh, so these are not things that uh, are uh, existing in the, in the knowledge base needed to create zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. That's why we have a research program. And uh, the university has the expertise to do that. And I think the key thing from Alex's presentation is a lot of work has gone into, for example, scoping the supergrid from a commercial perspective. But they see uh, challenges, barriers, opportunities on the way that they can't uh, uh, research and, and understand in depth. And that's why they require the partnership with, with us to do that. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, so I mean, the other point, I think we have to think about the hydrogen side of the equation. I mean, uh, you know, Japan, South Korea, uh, China, and other countries, uh, you know, have industry policy strategies to incorporate the idea of increasingly using hydrogen, for example, within their energy system. So the key question when you think about it is what the competitiveness of Australian exports would be relative to that domestically produced, those domestically produced products. And that's really a research question that's quite answering. Another thing that I think you know, would be a really concrete kind of research outcome associated with answering these questions will be a kind of an analysis of the life cycle carbon emissions associated with exports that incorporate both production here as well as transport and usage within country relative to uh, what might be being produced within uh, Japan and these other countries as well. Uh, Recognising that many of the plants in those countries are not using low carbon energy sources in order to create hydrogen to fuel uh, fuel cell vehicles and other such things. So I think you know that it kind of builds on a number of plans which already exist within the Asian Pacific economies. And the real question is, you know, how competitive can we be? And what are the carbon implications of, of participating in those supply chains? Thank you. I'm Gabrielle Gammer here from the Australian National University. Um, that's a really exciting proposal. I'm going to ask you a mean question, and I should declare a conflict of interest that I'm from a competing bid. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what interests me about the proposals is that these are meant to be high-risk proposals. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear from you what are the high-risk aspects of your proposal? OK, so that depends on which aspect you're looking at. I would say, uh, and Alex can maybe comment on this, that uh, the high risk from the uh, Asian supergrid side of things is, is less of a technology risk, although there are a lot of challenges there. Uh, it's more uh, a risk from the uh, socio-economic and geopolitical side of things. So let's, let's frame this question as, uh, as, a, as a sort of demand push versus, uh, sorry, de demand pull versus technology push uh, type of uh, question. Uh, the technology push side of things, I think we can see our way forward. The demand pull side of things, however, that really needs a lot of work, and that's where we have expertise. On the other side of things, with the uh, renewable fuels and products, uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done at the sort of fundamental science and technology end of things in, in the push supply phase. Uh, uh, but there's, there's still also working with demand pool to create these techno-economic uh, pathways to uh, do exactly what the first question uh, suggested, which is understand what the drivers are in Asia-Pacific uh, economies uh, and, and governments. Uh, so the risk there, I think, is more at the technology end than at the, uh, at the, at the uh, demand for driving end. So that's a very quick answer to a very complex question.
My name is uh, Jochen Trump, not the all important F at the end. Um, I'm in engineering here, yeah, in Europe. Um, so, when you talk about the economic challenges associated with this, um, you focus on the competitiveness with um, locally produced hydrogen, for example, in places like Japan. Um, from the way you describe this, um, I believe the real challenge will be in finding the investment that you need in order to set this up at the scale that's required to work. So, and in that space, you're not actually competing with um, locally produced resources in other countries. What you're competing with is different investment objectives of people like BHP or Rio Tinto or Arami or you name them. And so the question would be, how would you be competitive in that process? <laughs> That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I guess our experience is you, you get great projects and the money follows. Um, I don't want to be flippant, but uh, we have done this a few times. For the project size, for example, the state one of the super grid is $14 billion. It's a lot of money, but on the other hand, LNG projects are $35 billion and upwards. Um, economics is very important, but it is actually a matter of getting a, uh, a product, which is clean energy, at a, at a compelling price into the market. So that it, that, comes, uh, that would underpin the feasibility of the super grid project. Uh, the hydrogen one, I think there's another, there's a few years there, but eventually when we do get this, uh, when, it's, when it's cracked and when it becomes uh, viable for large scale, we will see the, the hydrogen uh, extraction coming from areas where you have the cheapest power. So you've got to look at the regions in the world where one can produce the, the cheapest generation. And in our view, that's exactly where we're putting the wind solar resource for the super grid. And that, in some ways, is the beauty of it, in that we've actually got two, two journeys running in parallel, and they may well cross over. And, um, and furthermore, in terms of uh, where would the money ultimately come from, I, we would see, a, for example, on the, on the super grid project, it would be a consortium of equity where various investors, not only Australian, but we would see Singaporean, Indonesian, Asian. Uh, the types of investors would typically be signing a $500 million to a $1 billion ticket, and you would need maybe anywhere between three to six. There would be the banks, numerous banks, of course, the, um, the ECAs, the export credit agencies. Our partners at the moment for this project include the largest turbine supplier in the world, which is Vestas from Denmark, Prismium, the largest cable manufacturer in the world, which is in Italy, but GE on the converters, GE Alstrom, Swire uh, from Hong Kong doing the big, uh, the big ships. So there's a beauty about bringing in an international community of support here and suppliers because you also tap into export credit agencies and of course, ultimately, political risk insurance associated with a major project for services. <coughs> As for the hydrogen, economics will determine project feasibility. If the projects are feasible and the economics are attractive, the money always follows. We have time for one more quick question and then I'll need to close down for this session. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Uh, thank you. It's a really exciting project. Um, 50 square kilometres is quite a lot, and a thousand turbines is quite a lot, and it's terribly exciting. But if it was in my backyard, I might be a little bit worried. And I'm wondering uh, whether you've undertaken any consultation yet, or thought about how you might undertake that consultation with the owner, the indigenous owners of that land, or is that still a thought problem? No, very good question. They were one of the first uh, stakeholders that we did consult. So we've had uh, numerous consultations with the uh, Ngunnawal people, and they're very supportive. Um, we've also uh, consulted with the, the local shires of Brief and Newman. Um, we haven't gone into broad public consultation just yet. I should say I was up there about uh, three weeks ago and took a helicopter over the site. We went out for seven and a half hours and we still didn't cover the site. It is enormous. Uh, the closest uh, uh, area with any inhabitation.
station is the Sandbar Roadhouse, which is 70 kilometres away. It really is quite remote. But we've all already engaged uh, traditional owners. They're helping us with the ecology work that's being done at the moment. Mm -hmm. and should we uh, perhaps also say that uh, the ANU has enormous expertise in, uh, in these areas and we will be uh, partnering with uh, the existing on the ground capability with uh, CWP and uh, uh, renewables partners uh, to, uh, to understand the local issues, the issues uh, of social licence to operate, the engagement, the partnership in the, in the project. Uh, and uh, once you understand those issues, you're much better able then to enter into agreements and, uh, and uh, contracts uh, to, uh, to push these projects forward. But the same thing also needs to happen at the other end, in Indonesia, in Singapore, and other parts of, of Asia. Uh, and we have enormous expertise in those areas as well. And indeed, it's the geopolitical aspects of this entire project that uh, really have a lot of interest uh, for us from a research perspective. Because it might be that by becoming uh, engaged uh, deeply in this interconnectivity uh, through energy, that we transform the relationship with our northern uh, region uh, and we multilateralize our uh, energy uh, prospects in a way that actually enhances security. So that again is a big research question for us. I'm aware there is interest in other questions, but in view of the time, I'm sorry I will close the session down here, but of course you know the members of the team now, please feel free to follow up with them uh, individually on other specific questions, but please join with me in thanking the first team.